So there's an old saying that the, the job of the preacher is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Some uh, who are here this morning may be surprised that I am I am preaching on such a topic as as what we're going to be examining today. But uh, lest lest you think that I am trying to offend you, uh, these are the words of Jesus. So it's not me; it's it's Jesus that is offensive to us this morning. I have to I have a confession to make. I have a confession to make. I like sin. I I don't like how I feel after I sin. But in the moment, it feels good. It's the rush of adrenaline. It's the feeling of, of being bad. It's a tasting of the forbidden fruit that is pleasing to the eye. I, I find certain pleasure in sin. Now, that's an awful confession for me to make, but a confession that I suspect all of us could make today, if not most days of our lives. Sin has been a constant companion throughout all of our lives. From the moment we told our first white lie to keep from getting in trouble when we ate a cookie before supper, we were hooked. But sin didn't stop there, did it? Sin became more pervasive as we grew older. It it took on a more insidious nature. It began to permeate many, sometimes even most of our actions and secret thoughts. As one author put it, My eyes love to gaze upon that which I should not study. My ears long to listen to that which I should not heed. My hands enjoy caressing that which I should not touch. My tongue lisps things that I dare not utter. My feet are swift to take me to my desire's destination. When Jesus confronts us, when Jesus confronts us of our sin, both inward and outward, We simply wish he never would have said it. Life would be far easier. Faith would be less offensive had Jesus not said such a thing. Giving up to sinful pleasures goes against our human nature and our desires. If sin were not so pleasurable, we could easily give it up. But sin... But sin comes in pleasant, appetizing forms that appeal to our deepest and most base lusts. The reason sin woos us, though, is because we want to be wooed by sin. No one is enticed by a lover they do not want to love. Like its stubborn child unwilling to give up a lollipop, I stubbornly resist this command of Jesus. I just simply wish that he never said it. Today we're continuing this series examining things that we wish Jesus just never said. What Jesus says oftentimes makes our life more difficult. We wish Jesus had never said these things because we think in our own mind that life would be so much easier, that that life would would just flow a little bit easier had Jesus not said that these things, these, these awful things that, he wish he, that we wish he hadn't said. Things like, love your enemies. We examined that last week. It seems as though life would be so much easier if we went on hating our enemies. But Jesus knew better. He knew better. And we're called to love our enemies. That's what, that's what gives meaning and purpose to life. It's when we love our enemies, not just loving our, loving our family and our friends and our neighbors. No, loving even our enemies. I wish Jesus hadn't said it. Again, that make these, these, these difficult things make, make faith offensive, at least to our base yearnings. Jesus offends our human inclinations, and no doubt in our passage of Scripture today, he deeply offends us. In the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus didn't shy, he never shied away from controversial topics. Divorce and remarriage, anger, generosity toward others, retaliation, worry, judging others. He didn't seem to leave anything out, even lust. Even lust. Did you hear what he said? You have heard that it was said. By the way, that's the recipe that he uses throughout the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said. He quotes then a a Mosaic law law of the Old Testament, and then he follows it up by saying, but I say, he follows that same recipe here. 
you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And absolutely, absolutely, it is very clear in the Mosaic law, very clear in the Mosaic law that adultery is forbidden. It is wrong. It is forbidden. No matter how much you may may desire that person, it is wrong and forbidden to commit adultery. But Jesus clarifies what it means to commit adultery. As the Jews were, they were, they were always trying to figure out, okay, so there's a prohibition against committing adultery, so what is it to commit adultery? Jesus helps us clarify it. You have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman, and I would, might add a man, with lustful intent, has already committed adultery with her or him in his or her heart. Anyone who looks at another person with lust in their heart has already committed adultery in their own mind. If you look at a man or a woman lustfully, you have committed adultery in your heart. And that's simply something I wish Jesus had never said. But then he takes it to the next level. Did you get it? If your right eye causes you to sin... Tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of, the mem- one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Jesus here is using hyperbole. Hyperbole, if you don't remember from high school English class, is an exaggerated statement not to be taken literally, but used to make a point. And Jesus uses almost the exact same language, and he makes the exact same point in chapter 18 of the Gospel of Matthew. He says almost the exact same thing as he ends with the saying, for it is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet and thrown into eternal fire. Now hear me, hear me, lest you think that I'm a hellfire and brimstone preacher this morning. I'm just simply quoting the words of Jesus. Some throughout the years, some throughout the years have have missed Jesus' use of hyperbole. The story is told that Origen, an early church father, actually castrated himself in obedience to this passage of Scripture. There have been multitudes of others who believe that you must punish your bodies into submission. And, and by the way, so coming here this morning, I, I don't see a whole bunch of lame and n- no people with no hands and no eyes here this morning, so we obviously recognize that Jesus is speaking hyperbole. So what in the world is Jesus saying? Because oftentimes as we come across this this passage, we are so struck with his overstatement here that we ignore what he's really saying. So what is he saying? The first thing, the first thing that he's saying, I believe, is lust is a sin. It's a sin. Lusting after another person is a sin. Again, that's different from what the law of Moses said. Only the act of adultery was a sin in the law. But Jesus takes it to the next level when he says that those who lust after another person have committed adultery in their heart. Now, it doesn't appear to me that he's actually equating lust with adultery. Those two things are quite different. But he is getting to the very core of adultery, and that is lust. And we can't deny that lust is present throughout our culture. We are likely living in the most sexualized culture in history, or at least, at least since the Christianization of the West. Pornography has multiplied exponentially in the last 20 years. Today, one-third of all internet downloads are, are pornographic. One-fourth of all American adults admit to watching pornography in the last month. There are 428 million pornographic web pages today. As pornography has become more mainstream and younger and younger children are exposed to it, the depth of perversion has increased. No wonder we have, an entire, we have entire generations who are confused. 
If you're thinking to yourself, boy, I wish the pastor wasn't talking about these things with my, with my children with my children present, I think you likely need to be thinking instead about how you're going to be talking with your children and your grandchildren about this. In a survey from earlier this year, this year, a survey from earlier this year found that, found that over half of 12-year-old children in America have, have viewed pornography. Over 50% of 12-year-old children have seen pornography. Half of those who have viewed pornography did so accidentally. They clicked on a link. They thought it was leading one place, and it led to a pornographic website. Studies have shown that ongoing exposure to pornography at a young age creates significant confusion around sexuality. Parents, grandparents, talk to those children in your life about this. If you don't talk with them about it, they're going to learn the hard way. They're going to learn the hard way. Talk to your children about Uh, about this demonic influence that has ravaged our young generations. But adults, adults, I want you to hear very clearly what Jesus is clearly saying. Lust is a sin. Lust produced by viewing pornography is a sin. And it's a sin because it decreases intimacy with others. It makes other people objects to be used or objects to be viewed rather than as children of God. Decreases intimacy. I've had multiple couples in my office over the years whose marriages are falling apart because of the lust that pornography has produced in their marriages. So that's the first thing Jesus says. Lusting after another person, lusting after someone else is a sin. The second thing, The second thing that Jesus says is that we must deal ruthlessly with sin. Now this sounds harsh and and likely, likely the reason that we wish Jesus had never had never said it, but sin will lead to hell just as Jesus said. You don't hear that much in Methodist churches, by the way, anymore. He was very clear. He was very clear on it. Jesus insists, Jesus insists that that anything which is a cause of or a seduction to sin must be completely cut out of life, must be surgically excised from life. It must be cut out. It must be cut off. The alcoholic often finds himself having lots of business meetings in the pub It's not wise, dear sisters and brothers. The cynic of which I am the chief, the the cynic must must prepare their hearts and lives for those seasons that they know that cynicism will rise in their lives. Those who have a struggle with greed must recognize that the more they get, the more they want. They must indeed commit themselves to a more simple life. You see, anything, anything that leads us to sin, anything which is a cause of or seduction to sin, Jesus says we must cut it out of our lives. Back in 1970, the great Christian apologist, evangelist, and social critic Francis Schaeffer got to the root of this issue in his classic entitled True Spirituality. He wrote, We are surrounded by a world that says no to nothing. When we are surrounded with this sort of mentality in which everything is judged by binges and by success, then suddenly we are told that in the Christian life there is this strong negative aspect of saying no to things and no to self. It must seem hard. And if it does not feel hard to us, we are not really letting it speak to us. What Francis Schaeffer is saying is that this walk with Christ is hard. And if we're not experiencing the difficulty of denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and daily following Jesus, I'm not sure that we're doing it right. It should be hard. 
because it goes against every inclination that we have. That's why we wish Jesus hadn't said such things. Because it's offensive to the way that we want to live our lives. We must deal ruthlessly with sin and temptation because there is greater pleasure than sin. Sin's joy lasts for just a moment, but godliness lasts for eternity. I want to say that again. Sin's joy lasts for just a moment, but godliness lasts for eternity. As as one commentator put it, without pressing it too far, we may conclude that it is better to suffer minor losses willingly than to suffer the ultimate loss unwillingly. It is better we suffer minor losses willingly than the ultimate loss unwillingly. So Jesus says to sexually lust after another person is a sin, and sin, that one in particular, must be dealt with ruthlessly. Some over the generations have taken this taken the statement of Jesus to an extreme. However, Jesus is not saying that acknowledgement of beauty is wrong. There are some people who are physically attractive, and it's okay to admit it, but it's not okay to lust after those people. Jesus is also not saying that we are, we are called to punish our bodies into submission. Again, Jesus is using, using hyperbole. Throughout the generations, there have been, there have been well-meaning and well-intentioned Christians who have, who, who have felt like they must beat their body into submissions. That was the thought of the early desert fathers. Many of the early desert fathers, they, went out, they literally moved out into the desert because there in the cities... They were experiencing temptation, and they thought to themselves, if I could just simply remove myself from culture, if I could remove myself um, from society, and if I could just live by myself a hermit's life, I would be free from temptation. They were out in the desert for just a very short time, and they realized that temptation had followed them out in the wilderness. And so they they began to believe that if they could just if, if, if they could just subjugate their bodies, if they could beat their bodies into submission, then they would be freed from, free from temptation. Many of them beat their bodies into submission, fasting for multiple weeks at a time, sleeping on hard floors, torturing their bodies, only to realize that temptation surrounded them. It didn't matter what they did on the outside. It didn't matter how many eyes they gouged out or how many hands they cut off. Temptation was still there. Maybe this story might help us understand this just a bit. Consider John and his relationship with Mary. Mary, his administrative assistant. John has always been stirred by Mary's beauty, but recently his gaze had turned into lust. Taking Jesus' words literally, John proceeds to cut out his right eye. Thinking that the problem is solved, he returns to work after a, after a period of, of rehabilitation, only to find now that his left eye was causing him to lust as well. So he cuts it out also. He now comes to work with a seeing eye dog. He's not terribly efficient at his job, but he's convinced that he's, that he's been obedient to Christ and is and is beyond lusting after Mary, but then, then he hears her voice, and his illicit lusting begins to rage, and so in a, in a, in a rash moment, he then cuts off both ears, just knowing, knowing then, knowing with no eyes and no ears, he will be freed from this temptation. Confident that it won't happen again, he walks by her desk, and he smells her perfume, and lust erupts yet again. And so he cuts off his nose after a bit of, rehabilit- a bit of rehabilitation he comes back comes back to work unable to smell or see or hear and his hand brushes up against hers and he cuts off his hands it's only then it's only then that John realizes he still has a mind and Mary's memory lingers there It's not the gouging out of the eyes. It's not a cutting off of the hands. For you see, it is in our hearts. That's where it comes from. 
It's a matter of the heart. And that's what Jesus is trying to help us to realize. It is, it is com- it, things come out of the heart, whether it be greed, whether it be adultery, whether, whether it be cynicism, it comes from the heart. I've spent every Wednesday over the last five and a half years meeting with a group of pastors, and, and the purpose of that group meeting is to confess our sins to one another. Literally, that's what we do for two hours on Wednesday morning. That's, that's, that's all we do. We confess our sins to one another, and we pronounce forgiveness of those sins over one another. One of the things that I've recognized, and one of the things that we've come to learn, is that sins start in the heart, specifically the affections of our heart. Early on, early on in that group, we, we often would confess, we often would confess our outward sins, sins that was ev- they were evident to everyone. They were evident to everyone. And then when those kinds of sins began to d- diminish, then we began to realize what we, would have all, what we had really been dealing with the entire time were the affections of our hearts. You see, when the Lord is the Lord of our hearts, we, don't, we won't then worry about lust because instead of viewing others as objects to use or, or to lust after, we then see them as children of God. When, when the affections of our heart are for the Lord, when, when the Lord is the most important thing in our lives, when we have given all that we have and all that we are, even the very depths of our hearts to the Lord... You see, that purges away all of these kinds of things. And when we see a beautiful person, we can, we can recognize that they're a beautiful person and they are a child of God. They're not something to be used or an object to be lusted or yearned after. So if you're having a problem with, with lust, I, I suspect that part of it might be the affections of your heart. Who's really at the very center of your heart? And second, second, I find that those who, who struggle with lust, and that's a, uh, maybe one of your besetting sins, I, I find that those folks, they struggle also with intimacy. They struggle with intimacy. They have very few intimate relationships. Lust, I will tell you, lust is a sorry substitute for intimacy. And I'm not talking about sexual intimacy. I'm talking about healthy friendships and deep bonds and close spiritual relationships. Joining a small group or a Sunday school class at church, connecting with a social group, entering into a mutual accountability group will help cultivate true intimacy. Hear me now. Hear me now. That we're, not, we're not just simply talking about uh, addiction to pornography or lust, but, I, but I, want, I, want, I want you to hear me. Again, one-fourth of all Americans have said that they have viewed pornography in the last month. And being a pastor, I know that it's present in every single church that I've pastored. I want, I want you to hear me, and I want you those who are worshiping online or in our television broadcast as well, I want you to know that the Lord Jesus Christ can heal you of that. He can, he can free you of that, de- of that demonic influence in our culture. And that, no doubt, dear friends, that's what it has become. It has become a demonic influence in this culture. The likes of which we have never seen we have never seen in this culture the likes of, of this kind of evil that is ravaging our country, ravaging our culture, ravaging our marriages, ravaging even our churches. The Lord Jesus Christ can free you of that. I want you to know that. This is a deeply, deeply spiritual thing, I believe. It's more, it's more than just yearnings and desires this is a deeply deeply spiritual thing and i believe i i believe it is a it is a tool of the enemy that is trying to snatch us out of the very hands of the lord i truly believe that god can heal you of this he absolutely can he can free you of this the only way to be freed the only way to be freed is to recognize what are the affections of your heart what do you love the most what have you given your heart and your life to have you given your heart and your life 
to possessions and, and family and wealth and success and cynicism? Or have you given your, all of your heart, all of your life, all of your affections to the Lord? You see, he wants to heal us all. He wants to heal us all. We can't gouge out an eye and we can't cut off a hand. That's not going to solve it. The only way it is solved is by giving the Lord all that we are and all that we have, every single bit of it. Would you bow with me? Oh Lord, our lives would be much easier had Jesus not said these things. Because it's so easier, it's so much easier to give in to lust. It's so much easier to give in, just simply give in to the sin in our lives. But God, you've called us to a different life because you realize that that the pleasure of sin is temporary, but, but the pleasure and the joy of godliness lasts for eternity. God, we pray that you would call us to godliness. We pray, oh God, that you would bind the forces of the enemy that is, that is trying to ravage our families and trying to ravage our culture. God, we bind them in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and we pray we pray, O oh Lord, that your love would so infill us that it would wipe out and push out any other influences in our lives. O oh Lord, we give you our hearts. We give you our lives. The affections of our hearts are turned to you today. Today, Today we put a stake in the ground and we say, today you are our Lord, nothing else, no one else, you and you alone. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.